Welcome to Twill, the week in health law, the end of times occasional podcast of record for the discussion of health law and policy. This episode was recorded on June 12th, 2020. I'm Nicholas Terry, a professor of law at Indiana University in Indianapolis. As the Twill listener knows, we've been using the podcast platform to celebrate health law and policy lectures and discussions that in normal times you may have been able to attend. Uh, while our George Consortium COVID law briefings are on summer break, delighted to introduce the Twill listener to some new content. So I'm happy to welcome back to the show Kamel Shakar, the Executive Director of the Petri Floam Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School, to introduce uh, the third in a great series of shows that she's helped us put together. Off you go, Carmel. Thanks, Nick. So as you said, this is the final out of three episodes of interviews that draw from Innovation and Protection, the Future of Medical Device Regulation, which was originally the 2020 Petri Flom Center annual conference. Of course, we were unable to have the conference due to the pandemic. These episodes highlight a selection of papers that were written for the conference, which was organized in collaboration with the University of Copenhagen Center for Advanced Studies in Biomedical Innovation Law, or CBIL, and the University of Arizona's Health Law Program. All of these papers will be published in an upcoming edited volume. This episode has a European focus. First, we have Timo Minson talking with Janice Mazaros of the Center for Advanced Studies in Biomedical Innovation Law to discuss their paper, Challenges at the interface of the EU medical device regulation and the GDPR. Do the rules on privacy and scientific research impair the safety of AI medical devices? Timo then talks with Helen Yu, who is part of the Faculty of Law at the University of Copenhagen, to discuss her work, the regulation of digital health technologies in the EU, intended versus actual use. We then come back to America for a discussion that Chris Robertson will have with Preeti Mehrotra, instructor in medicine, Harvard Medical School, medical director and associate hospital epidemiologist, infection control and hospital epidemiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, as well as medical director of infection control at Atreus Health. She'll be discussing her work, preventing medical device-borne disease outbreaks, improving high-level disinfection policies for scopes and probes. So very relevant to these times. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Timu Minson, and I'm the director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Biomedical Innovation Law at the University of Copenhagen. I'm also a research partner of the Petri Flom Center at Harvard Law School. And uh, in that function, I'm also co-organizer of our supposed to be conference innovation and protection, the future of medical device regulation. As we all know, the conference has been canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have have turned this into a podcast. And I have here the author of one of the presentations and one of the papers that should have resulted from this conference and that will result from this digital podcast. And that is my dear colleague, Helen Yu. Um, and Helen has written a paper on the regulation of digital health technologies in the EU, intended versus actual use. So Helen, I'm very happy to have you with me here. Thank and you. I would like you, you're welcome. And I, I'd li I know you well, but our listeners, they don't know you so well. So please, uh, could you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure, of course. My name is Helen. I'm an associate professor and associate director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Biomedical Innovation Law, or CBIL for short, at the University of Copenhagen. So I work with Timo. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary and international project that includes partners from Harvard Law, Harvard Medical, Cambridge Law, Michigan Law, and the Economics Department of the University of Copenhagen. I have a rather strange background for someone in my field. I have a degree uh, in neuroscience from UBC, the University of British Columbia in Canada, where I'm from. I then went to law school and on to private practice for eight years. And because of my science background, I naturally went into IP law um, and specifically into the biotech and biomedical field. So I'm a qualified patent agent as well. Uh, now that I'm in academia, I have a tendency to take a very applied and inter uh, interdisciplinary perspective to the law uh, as it relates to how to support responsible research and innovation in this area. Great. Thank you very much, Helen. What made you interested in participating in the conference on the regulation of medical devices? Well, it's actually funny. I have 
have several friends who are completely addicted to their wearable device. They're entirely dependent on them to tell them what to do, when to do it, and for how long. And they use this under the assumption that they'll be healthy if they follow whatever activity protocol their device tells them. So we would be like in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden my friend would jump up and start wandering around because the device is telling her that she's been sitting idle for too long. And then she paces around until the device tells it to stop and she sits back down. So there's these weird anecdotal stories that you keep hearing about how people are very trusting, very reliant on their um, devices. And the more I read about how people actually use their devices and how unreliable they are, the more I became concerned of how well these devices are actually being regulated. So I figured the conference would be a good forum to bring attention to these devices that often fly under the regulatory radar because they are perceived as low risk devices, but their actual use or if I can call them misuse can actually create a greater potential harm. Wow, this is really fascinating and interesting, Helen. But if you would like to boil this down about what you're interested in, what the paper is about, could you sum up your paper for us in a tweet? <laughs> Well, as someone who doesn't tweet or use Twitter, I'm actually not very sure what a good tweet is. But in a few words, I would say, is your wearable device regulated? Use at your own risk. Hashtag false positive. I think that was a very nice tweet, Helen. Um, and I then would like to jump into the depth of your paper. So your article focuses on the functionality of digital health technologies, which we now call DHTs in this conversation, which includes consumer facing products like like wearable devices and virtual assistants. Can you tell us a little bit of how DHTs have been changing healthcare, both the good and the bad? Well, DHTs are being promoted as these devices that can empower people to take control and responsibility of their health and wellness. And there's a lot of discussion that these can actually help reduce the cost and burden on the healthcare system. Um, for example, by giving patients better tools to self-manage their health at home instead of going to the hospital or going to see their doctor. Um, mm -hmm. They've also been credited for detecting early warning signs of health conditions, so alerting to some irregularities um, for investigation to, to see if there's an illness that's underlying them. And while healthcare providers are generally recognizing that these DHTs are useful tools, there's also evidence that's starting to show that these devices are creating a new set of problems that can actually increase healthcare in the long run. So I'm focusing on some of the studies that are referring to these users as digital chondriacs. These are people who get an alert on their device and they complain freak out and demand immediate medical attention. Um, these devices are basically setting off or potentially can be setting off false alarms uh, for users to take note of their health um, because there's actually a lot of data and reports out there to show that these devices are not particularly accurate. Um, so I think there was a report saying that there were the, that the margin of error is uh, as, as high as 25% across these types of devices. So you've got a bunch of digital contracts running to, uh, to doctors. The doctors have always had to deal with patients who are convinced that they have a particular condition and they diagnose themselves using WebMD or something like that. Now they have an extra set of patients who are using these uh, devices to self-diagnose because they have these symptoms that's been detected by their DHTs. Now on the other end of the spectrum, uh, doctors are also recording, uh, sorry, recounting stories of patients who are basically taking their prescription medication in response to an irregular reading without actually even consulting a doctor or understanding what's the risk of taking a higher than recommended dosage of medication. So with the combination of these kind of two extremes of, of digital contracts um, uh, and also those who take medication or take make certain health decisions without consulting their um, uh, their doctors, then there's a incidence that we need to kind of look at and consider about how costly these um, um, encounters with the doctors can be. Wow, this is also extremely fascinating, I think. And also you can think about, you know, really crucial questions that will come up when you have to face a pandemic, for example, with a strained health system. And then people, you know, kind of bury the health system with requests based on uh, malfunctioning medical devices, for example. But we will get uh, more into the COVID-19 questions toward the end. So I would, before we get there, I would like to ask you, because our listeners, they're mostly from the US, so could you maybe tell me, uh, and our listeners, uh, or could you give us a brief overview of the new EU medical device regulation? Well, very briefly, the, the EU medical devices regulation, um, which was supposed to come into force in May 2020, was supposed to replace the medical devices 
directive. Now, because of the pandemic, the implementation of the medical devices regulation or the MDR has now been postponed for a year. Um, as a regulation, the MDR is considered a enforceable law in all member states uh, of the EU, and its intention is to improve the safety of medical devices. Uh, to keep up with the advances of science and technology, the MDR basically modernizes the MDD, the, the medical devices directive that it replaces, by strengthening the rules on placing new medical devices on the market and also by tightening the surveillance of these devices once they are available on the market. Okay, great, Helen. Assuming then that a digital health technology falls within this regulatory framework that you, the regulatory framework that you just described, how is it then regulated under that framework? Well, the MDR does introduce new concepts and definitions that are applicable to DHTs. Um, for example, the definition of medical device in Article 2 of the MDR includes new language to capture devices whose purpose is to predict, uh, sorry, for is the prediction and prognosis of diseases. So in principle, this definition should capture DHTs because they do collect, monitor, um, process, and evaluate data. And they are capable of predicting and providing a prognosis of future potential diseases. But the MDR also says that devices and software, even when used in a healthcare setting, if it is included for, if it's intended rather for lifestyle and well-being purposes, it's not considered a medical device. So it's the intended purpose as opposed to the capability of the device that determines whether a DHT will be regulated under the MDR. And the intended purpose is essentially defined um, in the act as the use for which a device is intended according to the manufacturer. So what we have here is the ability for manufacturers to basically avoid the MDR regulatory framework if they market the intended use of their DHT as a health and wellness device as opposed to a medical device. But assuming that the DHT does fall within the regulatory framework, there are classific classification rules within the MDR that basically assesses the um, device's potential risk to the user. So currently, there's a significant number of um, wearable devices that are classified as class one non-invasive devices. And this is the lowest level of, of, um, of classification. And as the classification level increases, the stricter the safety rules become. Now, even though the MDR introduces this more nuanced classification system to, include, to increase the regulatory scrutiny of devices, um, these new rules, these, these classification levels apply only to active devices that are intended for diagnosis and monitoring. So again, it does not include the DHTs. They perform a monitoring function, but it's not intended by the manufacturer for, to, for use as a, for diagnosis purposes. So it's very unclear whether or not these types of devices will actually fall within the regulatory scrutiny of the MDR. And even if it does, um, the classification system doesn't help with increased scrutiny. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks, Helen, for clarifying this. Now, the central piece of the medical device regulation seems to be the manufacturer's stated intent to which you suggest that it is a loophole that allows the DHT to escape liability. So there seems to be an analogy to be made between non-intended users of DHT and the off-label use of pharmaceuticals, which is not generally prohibited in the US or the EU, although it has to comply with market approval standards. And of course, there could be the issue of patent infringement. So how is digital health technology different from a drug and why should DHT manufacturers bear the additional responsibility for misuse of their product? Well, I see this as a fundamentally different thing. I mean, off-label use, if it's done properly, should be decided in consultation with a healthcare provider to decide on the use of an approved drug for an unapproved use to treat a disease or a medical condition. And marketing off-label, uh, sorry, marketing off-label use is actually prohibited. And in the case of unintended use or misuse, use of DHTs, consumers are basically emboldened by marketing language like medical grade results, and they decide to go uh, on their own to use DHTs to make medical decisions, despite whatever the manufacturer's stated intent is. So, and discussed earlier, many of these devices are not accurate or they fail to work at all, but manufacturers still proclaim medical benefits while disclaiming that the medical device, uh, sorry, that the device is intended for health and well-being purposes only. So without an oversight mechanism to respond to the health risks arising from the actual use of these devices, then um, there could be consumer harm throughout the life cycle of the product. If the manufacturers are able to avoid this regulatory burden by having their products classified as a medical device, the question is what legal framework exists to hold manufacturers responsible for the known misuse of their products. 
So, Helen, you also suggest that post-market surveillance should be required for manufacturers of digital health technologies to obtain actual use information to avoid escaping liability. Now, what are the current obligations around post-market surveillance under the medical device regulation? Under the MDR, the post-marketing system is a, a proactive procedure where manufacturers are to collect, review, and report on experiences of devices uh, on the market with the aim of identifying if there are any kind of protect correct or preventative measures that need to be taken. Now, one of the new features of the MDR is the concept of the post-marketing plan that requires manufacturers to define the process of collecting, assessing, and investigating incidents and market-related experiences reported by healthcare professionals, patients, and users on um, adverse events related to the medical device. Now, however, the MDR is not particularly clear on the extent of these obligations, basically saying that the post-marketing plan should be proportionate to the risk class and appropriate for the type of device. As previously discussed, because of the whole uh, classification system with uh, DHTs being um, classified as class one devices, so they're a lower risk, there isn't really much clarity as to how much information should be collected, how often a report should be made, um, and you know even what type of information should be included in these reports. Can you then elaborate on how that would inform regulatory decisions and help consumers who suffer harm? Now, arguably, the PMS plan can be interpreted to include an obligation to, co to collect post-marketing data on consumer use of DHTs as part of a mandatory re-evaluation process to assess the appropriate classification level and the regulatory compliance the DHT should adhere to in order to continue to remain on the market. So what I'm proposing is that if we link these post-marketing plan and post-marketing surveillance obligations as a condition for a DHT to continue to qualify and benefit from a lower risk classification under the MDR, then we can start making more informed regulatory decisions based on actual evidence of consumer use. If consumers, uh, if consumer DHTs rather are being advertised as providing medical grade results and therefore being used by the consumers as a medical device, the MDR needs to be able to provide adaptive measures to respond to how DHTs are actually being used despite the manufacturer's intended purpose. So leveraging the PMS plan to require manufacturers to proactively monitor, collect, and report on actual use of their DHTs by the consumers in order for them to qualify for classification, the lower classification, and the lower burden of regulation. This will kind of convey accountability and provide evidence-based oversight mechanism within the MDR to garner public trust. And in order to achieve this, the MDR must provide clear implementation guidelines that better align these PMS obligations uh, with the classification rules applicable to the DHTs. As advocated by some medical professionals, if medical decisions will be made from information generated by these devices, then these DHTs will require proportionate regulatory oversight. Now, these are really interesting challenges and proposals that you make, Helen. And I think it will keep the legislators, judges, practitioners, patients in the area really busy, I think, the next couple of years to, to assess these kind of challenges and also the proposals that you make. Uh, so thank you very much for this very interesting overview you and also the interesting suggestions that you make. I, I promised in the beginning of our interview that I would come back to the COVID-19 crisis. So now there are many issues that relate to medical devices, I think, that you could come up when it comes to COVID-19. But for this particular paper of use, I would like to ask you the following. Now, Helen, as we know, the new EU medical device regulation was supposed to come into force in May this year. So I wonder how has the COVID-19 crisis impacted the enforcement of the regulation? And from what we know so far, how have the manufacturers of digital health technologies been impacted? Now, as I mentioned earlier, the implementation of the regulation actually has been postponed for a year to take the pressure off of the national authorities, manufacturers, and other parties that are impacted by the new regulations so they can focus more on urgent priorities related to coronavirus. Um, COVID-19 has had an impact on the regulatory framework and on the medical devices market. So we've seen some temporary regulations, relaxing rules around CE marking. That's the European Conformity Certification Mark of indicating conformity with health and safety standard uh, of products sold within the EU. So these markings have been relaxed for PPE and urgently needed medical devices in some of the European countries. 
the European Commission has also temporarily required authorization approvals for the export of certain medical devices, making it difficult for companies to honor their contractual obligations to supply these devices to other countries. So COVID has put a lot of pressure on companies to innovate and deliver arguably at the uh, temporary expense of regulatory safeguards. So it'll be interesting to see uh, when the focus will return to implementing the MDR. I'm happy to have with me now one of our esteemed authors, Janos Mesarosch, who has authored, or should I say co-authored, a paper with the title The Interaction of EU Medical Device Regulation and Data Protection. Do current laws impair the safety and performance of AI-driven medical devices? So this is, of course, a pretty interesting question. And that is why I'm looking very much forward to our little interview here now. So, Janos, can you introduce yourself to our listeners, please? Thank you for the opportunity, Timo. I am Janos Mezarosz, a postdoctoral researcher, and I work at the National Academy of Science in Taiwan in a project focusing on medical AI. Great. And what made you interested in participating in the conference on the regulation of medical devices? In the previous years, my research focused on medical law and data protection and medical devices combine these issues. My co-authors, Timo Minzen and Marcello Corrales, let me know about this opportunity. Can you sum up your paper for us in a tweet or just in a few short sentences, please? Uh, we try to find the balance between privacy and providing health data for AI medical devices. Now, I think we should go a little bit deeper into the paper. And the first question I have then is if you could give us some background on how health data have been regulated under the the European Data Protection Regulation, which is called GDPR. And maybe you could also introduce our listeners to some relevant concepts under the GDPR. The EU General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, is a very strict law to protect privacy, especially in the case of sensitive data such as health information. In general, the processing of health data is prohibited under the GDPR. But there are some exemptions, for example, public interest or scientific research. Okay, and, and how does the GDPR interact with the typical life cycle in the collection and processing of health data in the medical device area? So the GDPR is applied for the whole life cycle of medical devices. For example, when a medical image software is made to find cancer in X-ray images, and also later when this program is operated in a hospital, the GDPR still regulates it. So the use of health data poses particular data privacy risks. For example, as you mentioned in your paper, the use of AI in a medical context is particularly challenging due to the difficulty of differentiating purposes of data. So now my question is, how capable is the GDPR at addressing this type of challenge? With better technology like AI and machine learning, health data can help to save lives and make healthcare systems more efficient. Governments all around the world try to use health data. For example, Italy gave access to millions of people's health data for IBM to improve healthcare. The GDPR is strict, but also flexible when it comes to public health purposes. Even when the collection of data was for direct care purposes, later it can be further used for research, for example. Okay, so if applied correctly, the GDPR actually enables or could enable Able, the processing of sensitive data for public interests, public health, and scientific research proposals. But in your chapter, you critiqued the lack of clear thresholds for the expected level of public interest and a lack of definition for scientific research. Can you elaborate on your argument? Um, the GDPR permits the further use of health data for scientific research. However, the definition of research and the requirements are not clarified on the EU level. This can lead to forum shopping when companies Companies try to do research in EU member states where the law is less strict. Uh, about public interest, it is challenging to measure public interest, but we think with my co-authors it is necessary and also possible. For example, when your smartwatch is tracking your sleeping and exercise habits, there is a low public interest to use this data without your consent for a new purpose. However, when the COVID-19 has to be stopped, 
we can talk about high level of public interest. Okay, so you mentioned COVID-19, which of course cannot be avoided in these really challenging times that we're living in right now. Um, but I would like you to become a little more specific. So what are the privacy and data protection risks that are unique or are there any unique risks to using patients' health information for COVID-19? This is the first global pandemic that many of us have experienced in our lifetime. I think the most unique thing is that governments apply technology to track the location of the infected or potentially infected people and to enforce quarantines. This visibility of our location can tell a lot of other sensitive information about us, for example, other health problems or our religion. That is why it is crucial to set safeguards and retention period for this type of data collection. Mm -hmm. But I think we should also not forget that the GDPR requires, obviously, the identification when it comes to the processing of sensitive information, such, such as health information. And since the de-identification can refer refer to a broad spectrum of techniques. I now wonder what have relevant authorities done and what could they do to clarify this important requirement? Uh, thanks to technology, health data is shared and used more than any time before, so it is crucial to protect it. There are several guidelines released in the EU, but it is still different in the member states, what solutions would be the best and how to implement them. I think more technical guidelines would be necessary to unify the protection of sensitive data, because it is easy to say the data need to be anonymized, but the real question is how. That is indeed a very, I think, important question. Um, and I think it is a question that can have many answers. And I think one thing that complicates this is that in addition to the GDPR, we have different regulators, such as the European Medicines Agency, um, that regulate AI as a medical device. But we also have uh, the, uh, a special role, but we also have a special role for notified bodies in Europe. So what do you think are the current hurdles for these regulators to effectively regulate the area at the moment? When we talk about AI and medical devices, we can make a difference between two situations. First, when AI and machine learning is used to develop a medical device. So this is before the approval and market placement of the device. The second situation, when the medical device is already on the market and it is using AI to improve and update itself. For example, when you go to a hospital to have a CT scan and the medical device is not just analyzing the image, but it also learns from it. So far, only the first situation for developing, using AI for developing the medical device is accepted in the EU for safety reasons. About notified bodies, there are more than 50 notified bodies in the EU and their main task is to certify medical devices similarly to the FDA in the United States. Since there are many of them, their technological background is not the same to certify AI medical devices. With my co-authors, we think their process need to be harmonized to keep up with the new technology. So in what way do you think, Janos, should the jurisdiction of the European Medicines Agency, the not notified bodies uh, uh, and other you know, laws that might apply complement that of the GDPR in AI medical device regulation? AI medical devices are as reliable as the data which you give them. For example, if you only provide European people's health data, it will work uh, well only on them. That's why we I think it is crucial for the EU medicines agencies to cooperate with the data protection authorities to safely collect and use a wide variety of data. So as you have already indicated before, one of your suggestions is to harmonize the conformity assessment to allow for European-wide collaboration and avoid forum shopping. What are the legal and practical challenges to achieving that goal, Janos? Companies choose countries where the regulations are easier for them. With AI medical research, companies prefer countries where the governments are more open for sharing health data for research. The biggest challenge is that the agencies have different personal and technological background to do their tasks to certify the devices. And countries would need to give up part of their autonomy to unify this process. So, Janos, it seems like there is still much work to be done to 
harmonize the area. And I presume that there are a lot of, you know, legal implications that play and legal rules and frameworks that play a crucial role in that, such as, for example, fair data standards, right? So interoperable, interoperable data standards. And also we need more collaboration across Europe on the regulatory level. Would you agree with that, Janos? Yes, Timo, I agree. I think collaboration would be one of the key solutions to make AI medical devices safe and reliable in the EU. Thank you, Janos, for sharing your knowledge with us in this exciting area of law and regulation, which certainly is facing a lot of future challenges and, uh, and an evident need to harmonize this area of law. Thank you for the opportunity, Timo, to present the paper which was written with my co-authors, Marcello and you. Thanks, Janos. It was a pleasure. Hello, I'm Christopher Robertson. I'm here with Dr. Preeti Marotra to discuss her chapter uh, with co-authors in our medical devices book. Dr. Marotra, could you start with uh, the sort of case that really motivated you to write this chapter? Thanks so much for having me. So um, I am a clinical infectious disease physician. In addition to seeing patients, part of my job is um, involved with all things related to prevention of healthcare-associated infections. And part and parcel of that work involves thinking about how we appropriately clean, disinfect, and sterilize our devices um, in um, any clinical setting. Um, and so I'm often involved in investigations where um, there might be suspicion of uh, bacteria and particularly antibiotic resistant bacteria um, from a potential medical device. And so as an infectious disease physician, um, in particular, when I see um, cases that involved fairly resistant organisms in patients who don't have a history of antibiotic use, um, I am always in a position to be thinking about devices or procedures that that patient um, might have come into contact with. And so that was a huge motivation um, for me in, in bringing me to this work. So this larger category of hospital-acquired infections uh, has, has received a lot of attention and worry. You don't expect to go to the hospital and, and come out sicker than you arrive. And, and so you found medical devices as a potential, I guess, vector for these uh, uh, drug-resistant bacteria? That's right. That's right. Um, and it, there's an unfortunate, you know, I think, history um, to devices being a vector of a potential transmission event. And so part of my job is to help stop that from happening. Uh, so what are the typical practices for disinfecting, I guess we're primarily talking about reusable devices, right? That's right. And it, how is that typically done? Yeah, so just to sort of do a little bit of infection prevention 101, um, the way that we think about devices in the infection control community is based on a decades-old um, criteria called the Spalding criteria. And so we think about devices into three categories, non-critical, um, which is devices that come into contact with the skin. So in a common example of that is like a blood pressure cuff in an office. The second category is something called the semi-critical device. Um, and those are devices that come into contact with mucous membranes. So um, endoscopes that are used to get a uh, colonoscopy, for example, or endoscopy are a common example of that. And then the third category is the critical device. And the critical device is one that um, is um, used in surgery settings or surgical settings they come into contact with um, sterile tissues um, within the body. And so that is the framework with which we think about devices in the infection control community. And so when we think about, in particular, semi-critical versus critical devices, we think about something called the, disting the distinction between high-level disinfection or sterilization. And so the point of sterilization is to try and get rid completely of all microorganisms as possible, to be technical it's about a 12 log reduction versus high level disinfection, which is not as good as sterilization. It is uh, the category that we often use to describe what's required for the semi critical device. So, for endoscopes or colonoscopes that I mentioned. And that gives us about a six log reduction in microorganisms or better, but not necessarily required. And so, many of the devices that fall into the semi critical category that require high level disinfection are the ones 
that have been implicated in uh, device-associated infections. And what I'd say about high-level disinfection is that it's not an easy process. So I kind of think about it as how we think about washing our dishes. So suppose you are cooking a casserole dish and you're putting it in the oven and the sort of burnt edges get to the edge of the casserole dish. The first thing you want to do with that dish is you want to soak it right away so that um, nothing hardens on the dish. And so that soaking um, that you do with the dish is something that we call pre-cleaning. So immediately after procedures, the first order of business for these semicritical devices is usually some kind of pre-cleaning method. Then, you know, you might scrub that casserole dish a little bit, try and get off the burnt edges with the sponge. And similarly, there's a process in high-level disinfection after that first cleaning step where you try and brush away what you can. Then you go ahead and put that casserole dish in your dishwasher. And the dishwasher does more of the work, we hope, right? And so that's then the third step, usually in high-level disinfection, is taking those devices that have then been pre-cleaned and brushed and putting them into an automated reprocessor that then cleans or high-level disinfects the device. So great. So let me transition from the clinical and and technical side of this to ask, you know, really what's the role of regulation or law in in this process? When I think about it, we normally think of the FDA trying, uh, will approve or clear a device when it's known to be safe and effective, but it sounds like this produces a real safety risk uh, the second time or the, the end time the device is used. How does the FDA look at that. That's right. So many devices, um, as you know, are required to, um, when they're being brought to market, are being required to use the pre-market um, uh, surveillance um, strategy. So they are required to submit a 501k pre-market notification. And part and parcel of that for these medical devices, as of June 2017, um, and this is in response to events that occurred regarding um, the transmission of highly resistant bacteria with endoscopes, um, that there has to be validated instructions for use for cleaning, disinfection, sterilization of these devices. So what that means is whenever a device is brought to market, along with it must come a set of validated instructions that the manufacturer creates that says this is how an institution must clean or disinfect the device. And prior to 2017, that was not part of the pre-market notification for these devices. And in this context, does validated mean it has to be supported by evidence? That's an excellent question, and that's where a lot of the rub is. So the validation itself um, that's being brought to bear with these instructions for use are created by the manufacturer. So the manufacturer is telling you, you know, scrub this number of times or use this kind of a brush. But what brush they use or how they've come to determine that that brush is the best brush or that they have seen or come to find that if the method is done this way, uh, to to detect a, um, a limit of um, bacteria that's that is required um, that meets standards for disinfection. That process itself is not validated or transparent. So the validation, the consistency of the validation, and the standardization of the validation is what's lacking. So 2017 was a landmark of progress. I'm learning from you, but it sounds like there's more work to do. What, what do you recommend? Lots more work to be done. So the FDA um, in their sort of quest for validating IFUs um, relies heavily on technical information reports from the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. And um, that group has working groups um, that seek to define um, how these instructions should be brought to bear and what should be in them. And so the last time that those technical information reports were looked at was about 2010. And so the first step is updating those technical information reports. With endoscopes in particular, AMI, the um, Association for Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, has also created something called Standard 91, which is a more stringent standard um, that the FDA refers to specifically for endoscopes. That was published in 2015, and so that is in need of an update as well. And I think there's recognition in the medical device community, both within the FDA, but also the manufacturers and infection control practitioners, all of whom sit on these working groups in Amy, that there needs to be an update. Um, ideally, that that update potentially could benefit from more input from end users, all kinds of end users, um, and that all of that needs to be taken 
take into account in how we expect manufacturers to write and disseminate their instructions for use. Well, I'm really struck by the, the, the fact that hospital-acquired infections are a systems-level problem. I'm, reco- I'm recalling the Institute of Medicine's report, I think it was from 2010, called To Air is Human. And it really f- suggested we need to zoom back from focusing on the, the individual physician making a mistake to think you know, larger about hospital systems and their, you know, here at the disinfectation, uh, disinfection policies. But, but you're suggesting it's an even larger problem going all the way back to the manufacturers and these larger uh, society guidelines. Um, so uh, the, uh, a big picture um, for a very big problem. So thank you very much for this uh, interview, and we look forward to having your chapter in the book. Thank you so much for having me. And that was The Week in Health Law. Uh, you can find uh, Carmel on Twitter at, at Carmel Shakar. Timo Minson is at T-I-M-I-N-C-E-B-I-L, T Min Sebil, and Christopher Robertson is at Prof C Robertson. Well, Carmel, thank you once again for bringing the, uh, this uh, final episode to us. I do hope you will take this the right way when I say I hope we, do, we won't be doing this again next year. I hope to at some point see you in person as well, Nick. <laughs> well, I will do my very best to uh, make the 2021 conference. Uh, thanks once again for joining me. Show notes are at twill.com. I am at Nicholas Terry on Twitter. Thank you for joining us and have a legally interesting but healthy, safe, and sane week.